Tonight, we have a very special guest, Mr. Gene Chandler, better known as the Duke of Earl. Um, that record, the Duke of Earl, was recorded in 1962, six decades ago, went straight to number one on all charts. He went on to record other big, big songs, Groovy Situation and Nothing Can Stop Me. But I'm gonna let him tell, tell his own story right now. So please welcome Mr. Gene Chandler. What's up, Gene? Everything's good. Everything's good. <laughs> All right. So let's start off from the, at, at the very beginning with the Duke of Earl. So when, how did that come about? You were in a recording studio with some guys doing Duke, Duke, whatever. Just walk us through that process. No, I had... Uh... Actually, I was in the service. Uh, I had I came home. I think I was April 1960, and the group had uh, notified me prior to coming home that uh, they had uh, secured a recording contract, and they asked them to wait until I got there because I was their re real lead singer, and that uh, I would be home in about two months. They didn't want to wait, but they did. And I got there and they heard me and they accepted me. And uh, we began to rehearse to do a record. So we were actually just opening up our throats to uh, begin our rehearsals. And we were saying, do, 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 you know, D-O, D-O, do, 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 going up the scales. And they begin to put like a beat to do, 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 do. And I begin to put some lyrics and I said to fellas, say, fellas, we can't put a record out called do, do. We have to put, I mean, we got to, we got to change this. <laughs> this is our rehearsal chant, okay? <laughs> In any event, uh, uh, we ended up, uh, I don't know why I just started saying Duke. And they continued to do the background going up the scales and I began to put lyrics to it. There were a few suggestions. Uh, we went around the corner to our manager's house. She stayed about a block and a half from me and uh, sung the song for her. She asked, could she put uh, one line in there? And uh, I kind of, my shoulders kind of went up because this was the first song I ever put together. You know. <laughs> And so the line she gave me though was a great line and I couldn't turn it down, uh, Miss Bernice Williams. And I use Earl in the song because there's no such thing as a Duke of Earl, but there's an Earl of something and a Duke of something. But what did I know? I wasn't from England, you know, I'm 20 years old, uh, uh, but it sounded good. That was the main thing. The line she put in was, we'll walk through my dukedom and paradise we will share. And uh, as I heard it and sung it, it sounded good. So I had to accept it. You know, it fit right in with the song. Uh, so it was Bernice Williams, Earl Edward, uh, and myself. Uh, and that's the way we put together the Duke of Earl. And of course, later on, as we uh, uh, began to go with the other songs, one of the songs was called Night Out. Night Owl was the song chosen by the people who were gonna promote and run with our records. They turned down the Duke. VJ Record had made an investment to buy the publishing on Night Owl and they wanted to hear what it sounded like. Uh, when they heard it, they said, well, who, who owns that? And they said, well, nobody, uh, they turned it down. And they said, well, can we buy it? Well, the problem is I was the lead singer on all of the songs that we did in the session. And uh, this was our first, well, not necessarily our first record, but our second one going out across the country uh, was uh, the Night Owl record. It began to go up the charts. So everybody was all excited about that. Uh, meanwhile, I had to make a decision whether I was gonna go with the Duke of Earl with VJ Records or stay with the group with Night Owl. I decided because I always wanted to be a single uh, act, 
I decided to go with the Duke of Earl, which is which I wrote. If, if not, somebody else would have had their name on the Duke of Earl. <laughs> and uh, I went with it, and of course, the rest is history. It turned out to be a smash record for me. Yeah. What is it about the song that is still popular even today? Everyone has heard that song. They know it. You know, you know, people told me, oh, I know that song. And they started singing it. You know, what is it? Why is it still so popular? Well, you know, I think it was, it's probably uh, the Duke Duke being repetitive over and over because the children love that. Uh, I had a little girl. I was in a uh, in a Pamunkey, Maryland, I think it was, and I was at a place called Lamont's, and uh, a little girl came up to me before the show uh, with her father. She was about five years old. Well, she was five, as a matter of fact, as I can remember. This is probably about oh, maybe fourteen years ago, and she. Uh, uh, asked for an autograph. I, I, I gave her the autograph and everything and I turned to leave after saying goodbye. She, her father said, you know, can I ask you one more thing? I said, sure. He said, my daughter want to go on the stage and sing Duke of Earl with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, are you kidding? And so I looked at her and I said, well, what part does you do you know? And she said, all of it. I said, all of it? I said, well, okay. Anyway, make a long story short, I decided I would let her come up on the stage. You know, they say you're not supposed to follow children because that's a bad thing to do because they, <laughs> they're going to get theirs, okay? Uh, in any event, uh, Duke was the closing number. And so I thought I would uh, uh, let her sing it at that time and then I would sing it behind her. Uh, so when that time came, I explained to the audience, the little girl wanted to sing the Duke of Earl, so we was going to let her sing. Well, the cape was too big for her, okay? So we couldn't put the cape on her. Uh, we gave her the cane, gave her the mic, and gave uh, uh, put the top hat on her. Now, the top hat, we had to kind of cock it up here because it would have went down over her face, you know? So we kind of cocked, okay? And so the band started the song off. And I was getting ready to help her with the song and she knew exactly when it come in. She came in and she kept singing the song. She got to the middle part. She got to the, the ending. I, I just let her, she kept going. And the, the audience was crazy, went crazy. <laughs> wow. And she ended the song. Now she couldn't do the act that I do, the, the walking and the turning and all that. But she sung the entire song. And of course, that was it. I was not going to try to follow her. <laughs> okay. But uh, she brought the house down, you know. But anyway, I said that to say how I found out uh, later on through different shows and meet and greets with parents and they brought their kids and what have you, how the kids love to say, do, 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 go, girl, you know. <laughs> and so I guess the, the, repetitive pronouncing of the Duke, Duke, Duke of Earl is what kind of get to the kids. And I think that's what they like most. Yeah. So now you co-wrote the song and you performed it as well. So did you get royalties as the writer of the song and perform? Oh, of course. Royalties? Yeah. And I gave Bernice a piece for the line she put in and I gave her a, 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 a piece at the time. Well, I'm not a selfish guy. I mean, uh, uh, I thought that they lent something to it, and she did put that line in there, and I thought it was a hell of a line. We'll walk through my dukedom and paradise we will share, you know, because the dukedom is your home, your castle, wherever you live at, okay, and you sharing this with this woman, okay, <laughs> and uh, so you're giving her a piece of paradise in your home, you know, <laughs> and that kind of thing, okay. <laughs> So, so uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, I shared it with them and the royalties, God, you don't know until you live long enough to know uh, uh, how much money those kind of, those songs bring in. They bring in a lot of money when it's a hit song, a million seller that, that, that it is. My only million seller as a matter of fact. And the first million seller for VJ Records. The closest mm -hmm. they ever got to a million seller was uh, 
D. Clark's Raindrop. It must be Raindrops. Uh, but this was their first million seller, so of course it was a big deal to BJ and I. I was moving faster than I knew I could move, you know, around the country to exploit the record. I read that the uh, Spaniels were like your mentors, the group, the Spaniels, the R&B group, the Spaniels. Is that correct? Yeah, I went to Inglewood High School in Chicago, and uh, 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 I love Pookie Hudson, the way he sing, you know, and uh, we used to sneak and sing in the hallways and the bathrooms and everything at school, because in the bathroom, you had that echo, you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that uh, I used to love to sing behind him. And then later on, uh, uh, my favorite singer became Brooke Benton. But yeah, starting in high school, it was the Spaniels. So many uh, great performers come from Chicago. What is the Chicago sound? Oh gosh, you know, it's, it's hard to say. It was a little bit different from Detroit because Detroit is not as big as Chicago. And consequently, there were a lot of different recordings of different record companies. And there wasn't a company like a Motown who developed a sound and basically developed it. Only one that did that in Detroit. There were other companies that had recorded songs, but they didn't have that particular sound because uh, De uh, Detroit used the same basic musicians. And so that they developed that sound. The Motown sound. In the case of Chicago, we use different musicians at different times and some the same every time. But it wasn't, there were, nothing that we did was called a Chicago sound. Okay. You toured with the very best. I'm talking about James Brown and Chuck Berry and Little Richard. What kind of experience was that for you? Uh, it was a great experience, without a doubt. Uh, I didn't necessarily remember how great it was because I was too full of myself. You know, I was, <laughs> I was trying to build Gene Chandler. And so I went out there very proudly uh, 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 doing Gene Chandler and trying to make Gene Chandler good. So I, 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 I could have appreciated some of those other people better, but I was so busy dealing with myself and trying to make sure I was right, I didn't. But as I thought about it and the things that went down while I was on the road, I truly enjoyed all of those other acts because some of them were my favorite acts before I ever performed myself. You know, like uh, 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 Little Richard, Fats Domino, uh, these are all people that I grew up listening to. And like I said, uh, Brooke Ben became a favorite uh, artist of mine. Uh, so I enjoyed so many people out there and all those people, uh, uh, it was just good being around them, talking to them and looking back. It's even more of a thrill how I had an opportunity to, to meet and perform with those, those particular artists. Now you were involved with real estate at some, at some point. Are you still involved in anything anything outside of music? Oh yeah, that's uh, that was the reason why I had to retire. I mean, I had so many so many different businesses going on. I was an entrepreneur. I mean, real estate, barbershops, uh, clothing. Uh, I put out my own wine where my daughter's running that. Uh, but uh, uh, just so many different things I've done, and that what ha what has sustained me. What's has sustained me, has been the business. Um, so it, you know, I continued to work up until 2018. And I had said at a certain point, uh, I was not going to continue to work because I didn't think that when you become this old guy, you should be up on the stage. Now, I haven't deteriorated to look like some old guy, <laughs> you know, like I vision when I was young, you know. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I thought I'd quit while I was ahead, okay? I didn't think that in your 80s, you necessarily should be running around the country doing shows. Plus that was a lot of work and trying to run four or five corporations at the same time, you know, and then going out running, doing shows on weekend across the country, out of the country, et cetera. So I, I started uh, 
working myself uh, uh, out of the business in terms of going on stage, because it took time. Uh, my love of the stage was so strong, it was stronger than I thought it was. Uh, when you go out and you go to work, and for the last 25 years, I received standing ovations for every show that I've done, uh, that I had done at that time. And uh, uh, the thrill of the picture taking, the, the hugs, the kisses, the autographs, uh, the kind of love you get. My God, I mean, that's, uh, I miss the fans. That's, that's the, all of that, out of all of that I did is the, the missing of the fans. That was the greatest thing I had. So it took me a time to wean myself off of it, but I finally did it, you know, and uh, I'm kind of good now, okay? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, but it was a tough road, yeah. Now, who are your friends in the music business? Anyone that you're in touch with? Uh, yeah, some of them. Uh, 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 every now and then I, I'll see them or I'll get a call or sometime on holidays. Uh, my best friend is Jared Butler, uh, uh -huh. who, who, as you know, is still around, but he's he's kind of ill now. He has a, a a touch of Parkinson, and he's at home. So I visit and talk with him, and then I talk to him on the phone and what have you. But uh, uh, I guess I had a lot of friends. Uh, Charlie of the Drifters, uh, Charlie Thomas, uh, the uh, uh, the Dells. Uh, Chuck Box still, well, he's not here anymore. Uh, uh, I think Vern and the and, and the other guys still involved. So every now and then I'll see somebody uh, or talk to somebody or they'll come to town and give me a call and that kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, but so many people have died, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult. As you get older, people start leaving. So uh, I thank God and I'm still here, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, Barbara Ackley was a friend of yours. Her daughter is also a singer who's going to be doing the uh, this uh, broad, uh, podcast. Um, when you think of Barbara, what comes to mind? Uh, just uh, uh, a great person uh, that uh, uh, was involved in the same company I was in, because Carl Davis was my producer. Uh, we started together, and I guess his first big big hit along with uh, Bill Bunky Shepherd was uh, they both produced uh, the Duke of Earl and uh, from that point gosh we grabbed a uh, Tyrone Davis uh, Major Lance I gave Major Lance monkey time uh, I was going to record it but uh, he had to get a hit otherwise Columbia was going to drop him and then that was uh, uh, and as you know he got monkey time and he took off and in return, I got nothing could stop me from him. Curtis Mayfield wrote that for him. I was listening because Carl let me hear everything. And he ended up, uh, I told him I, I love that song. I gave Major Monkey, can I have Monkey? Uh, uh, nothing could stop me. And and they did. Uh, but uh, Barbara uh, was uh, writing with Eugene Record. And she was doing some answering on the phone up at uh, Brunswick. They couldn't come up with a hit for her and her contract was going to be dropped. And uh, uh, I told her, I don't think so because I'm going to do a duet with a female. I'm choosing you. So while we were doing in, in, uh, the album for uh, Barbara Ackland and Jean Chandler, Eugene Record came up with Love Makes a Woman. And the company heard it. And they said, yes. And the next thing you know, they recorded Barbara and she got a hit off of Love Makes a Woman. So we were great friends and uh, just had a lot of fun uh, in the business, living in Chicago and going on the road. I took them all out for a show, the Charlites, Barbara Ackland, uh, um, Tyrone, Tyrone Davis. Uh, it was all the people from Carl Davis's stable. And I was the starter, and so I took out a tour and took all the acts out. I tried to do like a Motown thing, you know, all the acts in the stable that we were with. We were on different labels, but we were all under Carl's tutelages. And so we went 
out there and just uh, had a ball and packed them in. We, we worked with the disc jockeys on a 60-40 thing. It was no guarantee. And we packed the places we went, uh, Houston uh, uh, Coliseum and all of those places. And we had a, a good time. And it, it, it allowed the acts to be exposed to a lot of places they wouldn't have ordinarily been exposed to. So when they, when they came up with the records, the jocks already knew them and bang, Barbara Ackland's record took off. Shy Lights Have You Seen It took off after that. Uh, so uh, yeah, Barbara was a, a great friend of mine and uh, we had a great time out there. Now, as a producer, did you produce Backfield in Motion? Or is that- Yeah, Mel and Tim. Wow, I never knew that. Yeah, yeah, uh, I was cool, gosh. I did Gotta Get Over the Hump with Semtech and Wally here in Chicago, Backfield in Motion. And I had uh, went off on my own when I started the record company and uh, uh, Gotta Get Over the Hump with Semtech and Wally. I was uh, recording for Mercury Records and I was producing myself at that time. That's where I recorded Groovy Situation. Uh, so Backfield in Motion was one of the labels with artists that I was uh, producing. And uh, they were out of St. Louis, Bamboo Records. And they were in the hole and lost a lot of money. Uh, they asked me to take over the company from who was running it at the time, I did. And uh, I heard what they, what, what they had in the, in the can. And I heard this song about Feel in Motion. So we went in and produced it. I produced it with uh, Bill Shepard and a guy named Carl Tarleton. You know, nobody ever heard of him before and then maybe since that time, but uh, we produced, uh, uh, I was a primary producer, so we produced Backfield in Motion. Wow, okay, all right. Now we have a, a school on the west side of Chicago. What kind of advice would you give to any student who wants, to, who wants a career in music? Any advice you would give, any suggestions, any help? Well, I always promote education first. You know, I know there's a lot of youngsters who have gotten into the business early in the game, but uh, I would hope that they uh, continue the education while they're dealing with the music and, and get those degrees. Uh, but outside of that, if you believe in yourself and you have other people who believe in you, uh, keep going. You know, I don't know it unless I heard them and then I could say, but. Uh, if you truly believe that that's what you want to be, there's so many different things that you can do in life. So many doors are open for you to do other things in life, to be successful in life and in business, uh, uh, like I have been. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, it's paramount that you get yourself an education. Now you were born Eugene Dixon. Where did Chandler come from? Uh, a favorite actor of mine on television and movies, were well, basically movies and television, was uh, Jeff Chandler. And I don't know why I liked that Chandler, but I did. See, I was signed on the contract with the Duques under Eugene Dixon. So when I went on to be a single by myself, I just shortened the Eugene to Gene and uh, took Chandler. <laughs> cool, cool. Now, where did you grow up in Chicago? Because I know that the street is named after you. Isn't that, is that correct? Well, yeah. Up until I was about 11 years old, I lived uh, uh, at the 46th place between uh, South Park and Vincent. South Park is now named King Drive. And of course, 47th Street was where the Regal Theater was at, 47th and King Drive, uh, or South Park at the time. And that's where I grew up at. Now, when I moved from there, I went to Inglewood. And I ended up going to uh, a grammar school there in Inglewood. And then I went from there to Inglewood High School. And it was 59th and Racine where they have my uh, street sign at, uh, mm -hmm. which is a great day because I looked across the street. Uh, it's not there no more. My mother had bought a beauty shop for her sisters who had went to school for beauty culture. And uh, she uh, had a beauty shop built and we lived in the back of it, okay? 
And of course, the beauty shop became successful with my two aunts. And my mother, she had her own job and so did my father. But uh, uh, that's uh, how we moved to Inglewood and how things moved from us. And we moved from there to another place. And then we ended up going to uh, live on the street at 59th and Laughlin, not too far from where the street sign at. But mostly everything happened for me when we lived there where we have the street sign. Got it, got it. Um, groovy situation. Let's go back. Story behind the music. Is there any interesting story about how you recorded that or when you recorded that one? No, except for that's when I went into the record business and I was producing all of those acts. I was producing acts from different companies and uh, the, uh, the Bamboo Records where I got the backfield in motion from, they had a group, of, a couple of guys who wrote uh, Lewis and uh, I can't think of the other guy's name, who was some of the writers they had. And I heard this song as I was listening to all the songs that they, uh, that the different people had written. And uh, I heard Groovy Situation and I thought that would be a great crossover record for me. Uh, there were people say that's not the kind of song for me and I disagreed with them. And of course, uh, that was my next million seller. Was a groovy situation. Yeah, yeah. Now earlier you mentioned BJ Records. A lot of folks don't know that that was a black-owned um, record label in Chicago. What's the importance of that at that time? Well, BJ was like the Motown of Detroit. I mean, come on. They had the Spaniels, the Dales. They had, uh, 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 I think. It was Della Reese ever on VJ or Della Reese was with us later. But uh, Jimmy Reed and blues, they had gospel, they had uh, uh, a jazz line. Uh, I can't think of the guy's name right now, but uh, they had a catalog that you wouldn't believe of, uh, of, of gospel, jazz, rhythm and blues, where most of the other companies they ran on a, with a certain thing, probably the rhythm and blues. Uh, or the blues, but VJ had a catalog of a lot of acts, and so they they were really uh, uh, into the business uh, heavily. So uh, I ended up uh, going there after they heard the Duke of Earl, and that's how I got over to VJ. Got it. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, Carl Davis? Returning to that name, what do you think of when you think of him, Carl Davis? Well, Carl, of course, uh, is the first guy. He was the one that made the decision to wait till I came home from the service, even though they didn't want to. And then once I got there, he enjoyed what he heard from me. And he ended up, uh, of course, uh, 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 allowing me to go back to the group and, and, and go from there. So my career started there. Uh, we had differences of agreement about different things. I ended up being a, a, the vice president of his company, Shy Sound Records. Uh, you know, and the Shy Lights was over on Brunswick. Uh, gosh, Major Lance was on uh, uh, CBS, the OK label. Uh, there was Walter Jackson. Uh, Tyrone Davis was on Dakar, which was a Carl Davis label. So uh, we started together. Uh, he had a lot of respect for a, a lot of my thoughts about music. And so we collaborated uh, privately at his home when we were listening to different things, what should go with this group, what should go with that group, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's how it uh, uh, went uh, uh, with Carl. And of course, I ended up leaving, uh, going on my own to create my own thing, uh, which was one of the best things I ever did, to go into business for myself. And uh, uh, that's how we ended up parting. Got it, got it. Last question. How would you like to be remembered? How would you like the world to remember you years from now? Just how would you like to be remembered? Well, uh, I don't, God, I talk about myself all the time. I was getting ready to say, I don't necessarily like to talk about myself, but I do, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Well, the benevolent things that I did. My career was my career. I've already stated that for the last 25 years of my career, I had a standing ovation on every show that I've done. Uh, the business part I'm very uh, part I'm very proud of because it allowed me to sustain and have some great things afterwards. In other words, I took the money that I made and put it into things that would sustain me as time went by. And when, it, when the day come that I would retire, whether I had to retire or because I chose to retire. So uh, I think that uh, uh, my benevolent things I am most proud of. For 29 years, uh, I fed and clothed, gave away Christmas trees, baskets of foods, turkeys uh, on, on Thanksgiving and Christmas Day. Uh, I started off by myself doing it. That's a long story because it was, it was a lot of work. But you know, when you're doing things that you love and you're doing things that are good, the feeling inside of you is so good that you're able to do these things you don't think about how much work you're doing. You just want to get to it and do it so you can put a smile on somebody's face. So uh, I didn't know how hard I was working, but I quit, I think maybe in 2019. It might've been 18 when I quit the road uh, because it had got to be a bit too much because I led the way. Like, I mean, there's four turkeys in a box. Well, when I'm loading and unloading, I lead the way and everybody else was following. So, uh, but I had to back off, you know, uh, and I think I did my part and I did it well. And I, I kind of miss that too. Uh, the kind of smile you can put on people's face or when you know you, like Christmas day would come. At one point I was going to the county hospital for about seven years in a row on Christmas day. You'd be surprised how many kids at the hospital on Christmas day don't get anything for Christmas because their parents can't afford it. Mm. And how I took toys and clothing to these uh, uh, kids. And sometimes their parents was there when we got there that morning. And uh, to see their face light up, you know, we had shoes, pants, toys for ages, age groups. I even served infants who did, couldn't even know who I was. <laughs> they were babies. So we went out and bought diapers and other things for those kids. Cause the hospital would let me know who would be there that day, Christmas day when I would show up. And that's how I, I knew what to get and what age of bracket to get things in. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's one of the, the great joys of my life being able to serve uh, all the Christmas trees to the projects, the housing, public housing, uh, the toys I gave away every year. Uh, I guess I was like a little kid for Thanksgiving and Christmas. I couldn't wait till those, that time of the year came because I was, was able to do my thing and I, I really enjoyed that, yeah. I guess I must be stuck on that one song, Duke of Earl. So got one last question and then I'm, I'm gonna end this. So you were named to the Grammy Hall of Fame for that song, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I'm in the Grammy, Grammy Hall of Fame. So what did that feel like? You know, that's major, major. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, you know, what happens is there are so many awards in this business and you get them here and you get them there. So, so I try not to rate one over the other because when it was given, it was given with great spirit and with heart and thought for me. And so I appreciate it just like I appreciate Grammy putting me into the, you know, to the to the Grammy Hall of Fame. So that's the way I, I kind of look at it, because there were some greater things where I had ceremonies where I had to keep myself from coming to tears from the things that were said about me. And then I was receiving an award. You know, like I was thrilled when the Chicago Defender uh, in 2018 made me one of the top 50 businessmen in the Chicago land area. And then they put my wine on every table <laughs> at the banquet, you know. Okay. So God, you know, I appreciate all of those things. So uh, I just appreciate uh, any time that I'm acknowledged and, uh, 
and and people want to award me. I don't look for it or nothing like that. Because let me tell you something. Uh, when you can give and you're able to give, it's one of the greatest feelings in the world. And only the person who's giving can explain to you how they feel. Wow. Love it. Love it. All right. I'm all done. Anything else you would like to share that you want to talk about while we got you here on Black Muse today? Black music will take care of itself. It changes like it changed to hip hop, like it changed from jazz to rhythm and blues, rock and roll. And it's always gonna change, but we have excellence uh, in each one of those changes. And uh, uh, so I just like to say uh, 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 thank you to all of my fans out there who made me who I am today. And uh, I love you and I'll always love you. All right. Well, thank you very much for this time. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having right. me.